Week four, marketing strategy and social marketing. This is the biggest domain that you will have to encounter and then filter down. So you start from this massive array of choices and opportunities and you have to walk out at the end of this week with a decision made as to which strategy you're going to use. Because each strategy comes with a set of consequences. So what you want to do in your initial phase is you want to work through as many of the alternatives as time permits. So you want to be asking the question, what are the options that are available to you? What models that already exist in commercial marketing theory describe the situation as it stands? And then, what are the possible consequences for theory, for planning, for practice, for decisions based on each of the strategy choices you have So we kick this off with, we're going to look at the market opportunity as the opening number. This brings us the idea of how widespread is our behavior. And as a social marketer, you look at this in two ways. First, you look at what is the current market penetration of the behavior we want to change? And what is the current market penetration of the behavior the new or different or alternative behavior we want to introduce. Effectively, what this means is that we're asking the question of where are you in the Ansoft matrix? Because change is something you are bringing to the market, the question is whether you're modifying a behavior, introducing a new behavior, how are you doing this? So we ask the question around the Ansoft matrix. But Ansoft isn't the only marketing strategy at your disposal. The second question that you want to be asking now is around market supply. For the pro-social behavior that you intend to use as the solution to your problem. So it's pro-social attitude, pro-social product, pro-social behavior. This is what you'll be thinking about here. Who else is in the market? What are they providing? And this is where you're looking at presenting the solution to a problem. Who else is solving that problem in a similar or related manner? And what do you bring? What does your change campaign bring to assist their pursuit of that solution? Similarly, what can you do to capitalize on the work that they've already done? Now we take here, say, uh, an exercise activity. You're looking here that you want to increase the ambient social fitness of a target market. We know that there are the 30 minutes of walking a day campaigns. We know there are cycling, pro-cycling campaigns. We can now look at how do we capitalize on what's already out there? If there's a strong public transport, pro-public transport campaign, what about capitalizing on the public transport of get off a stop sooner or get off a stop later and walk back? So you can encourage the two pro-social behaviors together. And this approach is getting you to start thinking in terms of who else is out in the market as your opponent and your ally? So you want to look at who's in play, what can you learn from them? And the triple play basically of strategy always is, if someone is successful, why are they successful? What is it that their product is offering? What is the value offer? Particularly, think about this from the point of view of you are attempting a product substitution. You are swapping one behavior or one attitude for another. So what made that attitude or that behavior successful in the first place? Look at any campaign 
in the same domain that's run previously that didn't work. What do you need to do differently, better, or with more resources compared to the last crew? And lastly, this is the skill set of the social marketer. Adapt and adopt. What else is in play? What can you use that someone else has done? And particularly, I really urge you to think, when you've identified your target audience, what are the commercial organizations, the commercial products that are targeting this audience? What can you learn about the way that your target market, your target audience is approached by a commercial provider? So we go back to the example of trying to improve ambient fitness. We look at who else, we pick a target market of the ambient fitness of 15 to 18 year olds. Who else is addressing that audience? Now if we find out that that audience is being quite heavily addressed by fashion labels and sports shoe companies, then you've got a huge opportunity to piggyback on what this group, what's known about this group by a commercial provider by looking for their secondary resources, looking for their secondary data. Next on the, uh, the thinking and the frameworks, this is a commercial marketing framework. And it's really important you look at this as a commercial marketer and then go, how do I adapt this as a social marketer? So, what you're looking for here is where can you get your advantages? And obviously, because this is a commercial frame, it thinks financial. As a social marketer, think financial and think social costs. So the cost relative to competitors is one of money and the social prices, time, prestige, effort, energy. You can beat someone on a financial price and lose on a social cost disadvantage. So we have a more robust framework or more complicated framework, but as commercial marketers, we'd look at this and go, well, do we have an edge? Do we do something better than somebody else does? And particularly, the question you want to be asking is, are we actually offering a better solution for a better price? Not just a morally right, morally correct, socially better pursuit of social good, but the actual question of, does this address the market in a way that is superior to the alternatives for less energy, less effort, less cost? You want to think your generic competitive advantage in social marketing. You have to adapt it, but you want to think about it. Next into the operations is you want to be thinking about how to get your competitive position identified. So you have a whole series of theories and frameworks at your disposal here. You've got competitor analysis, Really need to be looking at who is your opponent, what is it about them that you can understand and then work with. You also want to look at your competitive advantage. Do you have a superior advantage through the product offer? And that's your differentiation. Do you have it through your social or financial price, your cost advantage? Do you have it by being able to outmuscle your opponent in the marketplace. Can you beat? You're trying to improve the world. Can you just out hustle the problem by having better distribution or a superior sales effort? Lastly, the industry forces question is one we don't often think about in social marketing. It's one you need to look at is who's got the power in the market? What are the alternatives? Are market is this market expanding? Are people entering it? Are people leaving it? Are people getting out of the, a social change area because they feel it's been done or the problem's been solved 
or they're just simply bored and want to move on. Understand your competitive position, and this is about adapting and applying a whole series of strategy frameworks. Right, the last of the commercial strategy elements to really have to, you're going to have to do some adapting here. You're going to have to think, how do I reuse this? And this, it's four weeks in, this is one of your big challenge tickets here. How do you increase the adoption of your social cause? Or how do you improve the performance of your social cause? So you can increase sales. And again, you're looking at this from the point of view of you want a superior outcome for your campaign. So do you do it by expanding the market and increasing the number of users? Do you do it by expanding the share of the market? Or do you make your social change more efficient or more effective? This is an adaptation. This cannot be done cleanly. You are not going to be able to cleanly just go and say, oh, look, we'll just increase the margins on social change. You have to think about what that means and then adapt accordingly. And I'm not giving you the answer to this because this is part of your training. You have to be able to adapt and adopt these ideas. Now, sustainable competitive advantage, this is your, I say your final way of being a commercial marketer approaching a social problem. And that is you look at what do we do better? What does our social cause do better than the social problem? Do we have better skills? Do we, are we better resourced? I mean, if you are the government and you are tackling a social problem, you might actually be better resourced. You might be able to go just smash the social problem out of the park by throwing resources, time, effort, energy, skills, research, throw that at the problem. You also want to ask the question of, do we offer the positional advantage? Do we have a superior customer value? And that is one of the absolutely central key components. Can you beat your opponent? Can you be better than them by having something in addition? Now, those were the commercial marketing ways. Let's talk how social marketers often do business. Social marketers, we tend to think in terms of oh, look, that market's got the greatest need, therefore we should address it. Not whether we've got a competitive offer, not whether we're a superior alternative, but no, they have the biggest need, we should go for it. It's a weakness in the design of what we do because on one side we are marketers, on the other side we are social change agents. And our social parentage brings us to try to solve the problem to save the world for the most number of people, or the people with the most, the, high, the most need, the highest priority. On the other quadrant, we have the, uh, what is affectionately referred to as the low-hanging fruit, which is a stupid phrase, uh, but it's a phrase you'll hear so often, so it's a buzzword bingo phrase. Those who are most willing, ready, and able to respond to us. Now, in the social marketing way, going to those who have the most readiness for action is the ultimate, uh, it's the ideal way of doing it. But it's quite often the most criticized because those who are already willing to adopt are often seen as, oh, they would have changed anyway, you didn't have to get involved, but you didn't serve the greatest need. We then also have the markets of convenience. Uh, for everyone who decided that they were going to target an audience of school children because they were at school, that's convenience sampling done as a marketing strategy. But it's frequent and oft and happens all the time. The final question on this one is the, the interesting approach is a top down sort of industry side element of saying, well, what do we do best? What's our best match? And then linking that 
to the expertise we have in house and we'll go solve a problem for a group of people who we've got the skills to address. Now, what we're going to do is briefly line up a set of strategic models for the, the next shift in these slides. So the first question that we have to think about, first strategy. We are inducing change. That is the nature of a marketing, social marketing being the principle of social change and applied social change. So we're doing something to make the world a different place as a result of our campaign. So the question we need to ask ourselves is both strategic and consumer oriented. How much change is involved in what we're offering? So is it continuous? Is it a small change? Is it a modest? These are kind of loose open-ended definitions. Is it a large change? Each of these creates a different context. Specifically, that context is if you are looking at a new solution, a social marketing solution, and you are doing it from the perspective of is this new to, to the market or is this new to us in the organization? If it's new to the market, That then becomes a question of if it's continuous. So we look at the view to the market. Does the mar is the market familiar with our product? Is it continuous? Have they done it before? That makes it probably market penetration. If it's modified, it's a modest change, it's market development. Because we already produced this so to us internally, we already do this. If the market that we're addressing already, so we already create these behaviors, or we already offer these products, or we offer these ideas, and the market's very familiar with them, it's market penetration. If we already make this thing, but this is a slight change in behavior, or a larger change in behavior, then it's market development for our audience. And we step it up a tier, so internally to us, it's a, it's a new idea, it's newish, but it's something that's been done before by another in that audience, then it's market development, it's not market penetration. If it's really new to us, then we're into discontinuous, but it's been done before by the audience, then we are a new entry into that product category and it's not an innovation we're bringing forth to the audience. We just happen to be a new provider of the same solution. So we want to be thinking about these. Are we offering, are we repositioning an idea? Are we offering an improvement on an idea? Are we extending an idea, extending a behavior? What are we doing in terms of how new this idea is to us as an organization? versus how new this idea is to our audience. And in the subject of newness to audiences, welcome the product lifecycle to the stage. You're going to use this in three ways. First, you are going to look at it from the point of view of understanding that this is a descriptive model of how the world appears. And what I want you to think about is your social problem. Where does that fit on a product, on a standard product life cycle? Is this a new problem that's in the introduction phase? Is this a problem that's been around forever and just hasn't been dealt with? So it's sitting up in maturity. Is it recently emerged and suddenly been recognized as an issue to be addressed? So it's sitting in growth. Or is it being successfully addressed and now sitting up in now? It's cusp maturity and we're trying to push it into decline phase. So think about your social issue first. Map that to your product lifecycle. 
then map your social solution to the product life cycle. Because that's going to help you start thinking in terms of is this new to the audience? Is this new to the world? Where is this solution novel or is this solution actually mature? It's been around a long time and now we're having to try to do life cycle, life cycle extensions on it. Because those social causes are really important. Because sometimes we walk away from a social cause before we've actually solved the problem. All right, the generic strategies, this is your pick and mix. You get to pick one strategy, maybe two if you're really pushing it, but mostly you only want one because you don't have a lot of words to work with whenever you're describing a social marketing strategy. And secondly, they're not always complimentary. So the Porter's generic strategies, cost leadership, differentiation, a cost-focused approach and a differentiation-focused approach, which sort of break down in this pattern. Social cause as cost leadership is, can you solve the problem cheaper, faster, quicker, better, less social pride than another provider in the marketplace? Can you actually outmuscle your social problem by just simply outlasting it. Product differentiation, I think a lot of social marketers really focus the product differentiation or the niche strategy. These are good approaches. Product differentiation is a strong approach for a social marketer to take because what you're doing here is aiming to create something novel that the consumer desires. So this is the competitive product offer. This is product differentiation strategies, heart and soul, be better and more interesting than your opponent. Niche, I like niche as a social marketing strategy. I think niche is not anywhere near as common as it needs to be. Add your own sense of irony there that niche marketing strategies are kind of niche in their application. But this, as an approach, says small audience that we can address and solve the problem for that audience. I mean, this is a great start. This is how you go about solving problems is you create something that meets the needs of that market and solves the problem for them. Then you slice the audience up again to find your next niche market. All right, Joe, my favorite, you're gonna get to see my, one of my favorite, all time favorite strategy models. It's a commercial model, the Shell Chemical, and I mean, that is actually Shell Chemical Corporations. It's a 78 model, it's from um, the petroleum industry, and basically it's a directional policy matrix of the capability of the organization and the prospect of the market. What's great about this is that this is one of the few strategic models that has growth and maintenance and defense and exit built in to the structure. As a social marketer, what you can do with the shell matrix is you can think about it from your point of view of bringing your social solution to the market. We can also think about where your social problem is lying on this grid and what you're attempting to do. So obviously, ultimately, all of us want our social problems to be in the withdrawal phase where it goes away. But if you know that your social problem is possibly up at double acquit or growth or one of these areas, if you can assess that, then you can start thinking, well, how do I counter it? How do I move it across the box? So briefly, there are nine alternative strategies. These strategies are basically, again, these are commercial. If you have strong market advantage and you have a desirable market, this is your approach that says either hang on to that position 
and particularly this idea of leverage to support another category. If you look at operations like GetUp, they succeeded in a couple of markets and then leveraged that success across from being a leader in one area to growth strategies in other social change areas. So you can think long term, rather than just solve a social problem straight up, create a functional, viable social solution organization. The mid-card strategies, these are the ones where you either go all in, double equip, or you have to, you know, potential is there, but neither the market nor the strategy is mature. Or it's one of these areas where you are ticking over and getting the job done. Now, cash generation in this case is obviously going to need to be adapted, but I would call that as basically social success. People are adopting your behavior, they're sticking with the behavior, change is happening. So you then have an actual strategic question of whether to increase, defend, proact, you've got a whole bunch of choices. Finally, this is the defensive end. This is the, the social change approach that we have introduced isn't working. So this is withdrawal. This is where you look at a social cause and go, this isn't, we're not getting change or things are going wrong or we don't have the resources to take on this market. So you can withdraw from a market. It's not talked about very often in social marketing, but it's there. You can do this. You can go, we're not reaching that audience. We will step away. We will step back. Okay, the final, final phase here is that there are five basic game plans now. You get to use one of the five because that's the way that's going to make it the easiest for you to write a strategy, to work out what to do, to be able to form up a market mix. To These are non-complementary approaches. To build and to grow requires a different resourcing than to hold and maintain. Build for growth is expanding market share, bringing in new customers. Hold and maintenance is a defensive consolidation. It's ensuring that you have enough new customers to handle the churn, the turnover existing customers. Niche and focus is a much narrower Less, sometimes less resource, sometimes more resource, but it's a smaller, more targeted approach than what you'd see in build or hold. So you can't use the same strategy. You can't use the same thinking. Harvest is when success is happening and you are going into putting less resources in on the assumption that you're going to get roughly the same return back. And divestment is when you quit up out of offering a social a social solution to a social problem. It's where you walk away. It's where you go, either we can't solve the problem or the problem doesn't need to be solved, or the problem is sufficiently solved now that we think it's going to be a self-perpetuating solution. Governments do that a lot. So the final question that you need to address on this is once you pick, once you've Think through your strategies and you pick your options. Each decision will have a consequence. And the consequence is a good consequence. And this is the thing that you want to really focus on here is these are very, very positive consequences. When you pick a strategy and you work through your alternatives and go, this is the one I want to pursue, it gives you clarity. It gives you focus gives you direction and it makes it easier to document and make further decisions. If you know what it is you're trying to achieve, it makes it a lot easier to actually modify your marketing mix to achieve that. So, in wrap up, 
the usual deal. If you need me, contact me on one of the platforms, Instagram, Twitter, email, or on face-to-face. Strategy is a big area. Strategy is a complex area. And it's one where when you make those decisions, life gets easier. So I really encourage single focused strategic decision making so it gets to be more fun. The last thing I want to do is create scenarios where not only is it going to be difficult, it's not going to be successful and whilst being extremely difficult.